Hello, my name is Arthur Haas. I'm the harpsichord teacher at Stony Brook University. And I'm welcoming you to this concert of the harpsichord studio recital for spring 2021. You have a real treat in store for you. These are graduates and undergraduate students from the music department in my studio at Stony Brook. We will be performing the complete biblical sonatas of Johann Kunau, who was Bach's predecessor at the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig. Uh, although he's hardly known today, except uh, by early keyboard specialists, he was renowned in his day as an organist, composer, scholar, and theologian. Uh, and he wrote as many uh, masses and cantatas as J.S. Bach did, and four delightful sets of harpsichord pieces. These biblical sonatas that we will be performing for you today uh, are remarkable and outstanding programmatic works that depict stories from the Old Testament. And these particular stories that Kunau chose resonate with us right now in these sort of difficult times that we have. Uh, he chose stories that depict suffering and, uh, and adversity that is overcome uh, in the end, either through military victory, through uh, deception that is rooted out, uh, through illness that is cured, or through peace that can only come through death. Uh, each story will be narrated and introduced by the musicians. Uh, the music shows extreme expressivity and virtuosity. I hope that you'll enjoy tonight's concert. Thank you. Kunau's first biblical sonata portrays the story of the last day of the 40-day-long battle between the Philistine and the Israelite armies in the Valley of Elah. The leader of the Philistine army, Goliath, a fearsome giant, has, on each one of these days, challenged a member of the Israelite army to fight him. None so far have been brave enough to do this. This first movement is called The Bravado of Goliath. Israelites tremble in fear and pray to God for salvation. This movement is a chorale prelude on the melody Aus tiefer Not schreit zu dir, which means, out of deepest need I cry out to thee.
David courageously accepts the challenge, having faith in the Lord. Philistines flee in terror from the pursuing Israelites who cut them down. the joy of the Israelites over their victory.
This next dance is the Concert of the Women in honor of David. general rejoicing and dance of the population. The second biblical sonata by Kunau focuses on King Saul, who in his many hours of quiet isolation is afflicted with a constant anxiety. His moods swing through various extremes, such as a painful melancholy and angry rage, with no end to his suffering in sight.
his thoughts begin to overlap, creating this chaos that feeds into his torture. <laughs> God sends the musician David to help King Solomon. There, David plays his harp, 
with these comforting and calming melodies to soothe Saul's anxieties. The king feels refreshed and returns to the public. He is tranquil in his peace of mind and feels confident and renewed in his position.
Hello! I'm going to be sharing with you the third Kunao Biblical Sonata, which tells the story of the marriage of Jacob. It is a strange and complicated story, um, which has a lot of twists and turns. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview before we get into it. Jacob meets Rachel at the well, and they are really into each other. So Rachel brings him home to meet her family, which is what we hear at the beginning in this first movement. Um, and thereafter, uh, Jacob agrees to work for Rachel's father for seven years before he can marry her, which he does. And thereafter, things get complicated. We'll address that when we get there. But in the meantime, we'll start with the opening movement, which is titled La Gioia della Familia di Laban per la Gionta di Giacomo Loro Parente, which means uh, the joy of the family of Laban. Laban is Rachel's father, by the way, um, on meeting Jacob. Um, and it's a fugue in which each time the subject comes in, you can imagine a different family member um, seeing Jacob and having the same reaction. Um, it's a it's a very dear movement. So here we are. So now we get to the seven years of labor that Jacob undergoes before marrying Rachel. The title reads, La servitù di Giacomo faticosa si, allegrita però per l'amor verso Rael, con lo scherzo degli amanti mescolatori. Which means um, that um, Jacob's difficult seven years of labor are lightened and interrupted a little bit by the flirtatious banter of Rachel, who of course is living in the same house, kind of mixed in. And you'll hear in this movement um, the slow and ponderous years of labor and the uh, cheeky interruptions um, of, um, of flirtation with Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. 
seven years are up and we have a song from the bridesmaids of Rachel um, the uh, the title is kind of interesting it says 
uh, L'Epitalamio Cantato dalle Donzelle Compagne di Rai, um, which is literally the Epithalamium, um, which is a type of hymn, uh, sung by the women of Rachel's company. <clears throat> um, and it's a, a really, su I find it a really surprising and um, unique interlude in this story. So here we are. which is the joy of the wedding and the congratulations and well wishes of the guests. Um, and the um, and kind of the theme in this movement is one that's going to come back later, so keep an open ear for it. And this is where the plot thickens, because in the laws of Israel and apparently nature, Kunab tells us in the preface, um, Laban, who has an older daughter, Leah, who has not made yet an appearance, cannot marry his younger daughter if his older daughter is unmarried. And so, in this coming movement, the title of which is Linganno di Laban, meaning the deceit of Laban, 
he has disguised his elder daughter, Leah, as his younger daughter, Rachel. To be clear, Jacob is not in love with Leah, not interested. Um, but um, Laban puts her into the bridal robes instead of Rachel so that Jacob has in fact married Leah. Um, and this movement here is a musical uh, depiction of that uh, betrayal. continues with a little fugue in which we can hear the tiptoeing Laban kind of interrupted by a little bit of the theme from the wedding that, uh, that you might recall from before. Thank you. 
sposo amoroso e contento. The loving and happy husband. foresees some evil. puts them aside. He's hard. what's happened, and we have Il Dispiacere di Giacomo nel vedersi inganato, the, uh, the displeasure of Jacob upon finding himself betrayed. But this next passage must be where Jacob and Laban patch things up, and Jacob agrees to seven more years of labor, after which he can marry the actual Rachel. Uh, he's apparently not a good negotiator, um, but um, here we are. Again, it's not titled, but this must be their reconciliation. <laughs> now instructs us si replica l'allegrezza delle nozze which means we um, now we repeat the joy of the wedding so apparently he wants us to skip the seven extra years of labor um, which we had earlier and we're just going to fast forward through that and seven years later it's wedding time again
imagine they lived happily ever after. Hezekiah was the thirteenth king of Judah. Seen as a righteous king by the Israelites, he was much beloved by his people. After contracting an infection, Hezekiah began to fall gravely ill. The prophet Isaiah told Hezekiah that he would soon die. Upon hearing this news, Hezekiah laments his impending death. His prayers to God rise to heaven, asking for God to delay his death and return him to health. After hearing his prayers, God said to Isaiah, Tell Hezekiah that I have heard his prayers. I will add fifteen more years to his life. Hezekiah's confidence in God's mercy returns.
Hezekiah is filled with great joy at his miraculous recovery. In the midst of his joys, he suddenly remembers his mortality and his past illness. His dismay is soon forgotten as his joy returns. Kunal's fifth biblical sonata tells the story of Gideon, the savior of Israel. At this point in the Bible, God is punishing the Israelites for worshiping the gods of the Amorites, which he had explicitly told them not to do. And as punishment, God allows the Midianites to swarm Israelite camps and kill all of their crops and livestock. After seven years of this, the Israelites cry out to the Lord for help and he sends down one of his angels to tell Gideon that he has been chosen to save his people. However, Gideon is just a simple shepherd from the Israelites' weakest clan, so he is very hesitant and doubtful that he has been chosen. So he asks the angel to give him a sign that it really is God speaking to him.
witnessing these two miracles, Gideon is convinced that he has been chosen by God. And Gideon heads to the enemy Midianite camps and cowers in fear seeing the great army before him. As he gets closer to the enemy camp, Gideon overhears two enemy soldiers speaking to each other. They're talking about one of the dreams that they had about a round barley bread crashing into and destroying the Midianite camp. And upon hearing this, Gideon sheds his fear, no longer having any doubt in his mind that the Lord will assure them victory. Gained, Gideon heads back to the Israelite camp um, and tells everyone the good news. He instills confidence into the 300 men that are to follow him and he tells them to follow his lead. surround the enemy camp, trying to make as much noise as possible using trumpets, trombones, and jar tracking. <laughs> Run away in fear with
with the Israelites chasing behind them. Jacob, who was given the name Israel after he prevailed over an angel, who has lived for a long 147 years and fathered the 12 tribes of Israel, now lies on his deathbed. Jacob is surrounded by his 12 sons, who await their final paternal blessings with deep sadness and grief. Ephraim and Manasseh, sons of Joseph, 
as if they were his own. son approaches his deathbed. Jacob bestows upon Joseph a powerful blessing. father with much heaviness in their hearts. to meet his God. of the death of Israel with much confusion and uncertainty as to what is to come.
It was decided before his death that the body of Jacob would be brought from Egypt to his homeland of Canaan to rest with his forefathers. Now this long journey was with a great company of elders, counselors, and servants of Pharaoh's court, amounting to a great army of caravans. so great that the Canaanites called this place the mourning of the Egyptians.
finally, the spirits of those who survived Israel's death are consoled, knowing that Jacob is now released from misfortune and brought to a perfect and everlasting peace.